on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. We continue our breakdown of OU's roster by looking at the running backs and football guys talking basketball. We discuss OU hiring Porter Moser, and we recap the final four games. We finish up by giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, April 5th. You're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. Metro Ford of OKC's inventory is the best of the best. In fact, they own more Black Widows and more 2021 F-150s than anybody else. They're the only Roush and Rocky Ridge dealer in the state. You can find a ride at Metro Ford of OKC that you can't find anywhere else in Oklahoma. Just like their selection of vehicles is unmatched, so is their customer service. The Metro Ford of OKC Difference Program is included with the purchase of every new and pre-owned vehicle. It includes free oil changes for life, lifetime window tint, lifetime nitrogen fill for your tires, complimentary wheel locks, interior fabric protection, complimentary service loaners, a complimentary shuttle with service, and a complimentary multi-point inspection. Come feel the performance when you test drive a Roush or Raptor, and come see why the difference is real at Metro Ford of OKC. Visit MetroFordOfOKC.com for more information or go to the dealership and tell them we sent you. Now we're recording this on Sunday night and it is our 100th episode, Teddy, one zero zero. And our wives decided that was a big deal. They have decided that was a big deal. If you're watching the YouTube version, you see the custom balloons that they got us but also they got us cookies. Yeah. It which was... is funny because um, my wife, whenever she brought everything in and I was like, Oh, that's so awesome. And I gave, I mowed the cookies down. I knew you would once, once, once my wife was like, <laughs> Teddy's already got his cookies. I was like, Oh, there's no chance. Those cookies <laughs> have no chance. I know you well, if there is a snack in sight, that snack is going to that that snack's lifespan is going to be short. My wife didn't tell me that I wasn't supposed to eat them, so I think there was probably eight or ten of them. Maybe I had burned through all of them except for one, and she's like, so, "Whoa, hey, you got to save that for the show." She so <laughs> Caroline was like, "You guys need to toast." with the cookies and eat them at the start of the episode. And I was like, honey, that's going to be really bad audio. Us just eating into our microphones. She was like, oh, that's a pretty good point. Uh, but the cookies are delicious. I've eaten oh, several. Oh, man. They are fantastic. I I love that style of cooking. I don't know where they got them. But, cookie princess. Oklahoma uh, City, baby. Cookie princess. They were legit. I, <laughs> I mowed through them. It was yeah. awesome. Okay, just a reminder, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star review and comment with what guests you would like us to have on the podcast. Ted, let's get to the OU football stuff. Now, we're doing the running backs on this episode, but I wanted to have a little fun before we dive into the running backs. We've been breaking down the OU roster, but there was an unexpected development in the OU football world today. <laughs> And it involves Lincoln Riley's ability to smoke brisket. If you have not seen this, Lincoln Riley just enjoying his Easter, right? Just like a like a proud guy, just posting what he made his family on Easter. He uh, smoked some brisket. And listen, I am going to be the last person to judge another man for how he likes to smoke his brisket because. I do not smoke meats. I don't do that. I don't have a smoker. It's not something I've ever done, right? It's not something my dad did. It's just not something I do. So I'm not going to judge man for how he smokes his meat, but the rest of Twitter will judge (laughs) apparently because the smoke meat police is coming after Lincoln Riley's head. Teddy. Well, I mean, is it, is it really that bad? It looks decent to me. 
it okay so i'll just tell you that i was scrolling through twitter and i saw lincoln posted the 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 picture obviously of what he smoked and i clicked on the image and i was like huh looks a bit dry but nice yeah there you go and i continued i mean it wasn't a big deal it you know it's not not anything uh overly bad but then a little while later i he came through my feed again and i saw that he had responded to someone that said that is it me or does this look dry i was like oh god th that you should not have responded to that um i i don't know man i'll tell you that if you cut it all up like that right away, that'll dry it out. So maybe that's why it looks so dry. But I, that is one of those worlds that if you dance into that fire, buddy, get ready. Because <laughs> the meat police, as you uh, call them, which is perfect, they're going to come after you. They are, I mean, they are coming after him. <laughs> they are after his ass, Teddy. <laughs> I, it, it, and I'm learning, uh, I'm learning terms like smoke ring and all these things. That's what's interesting. There's no, I, I don't see a smoke ring on there. That's what's weird. See, I don't even know what that is. The, my, the only barbecue knowledge I have is from watching food network shows. That's it. If you, if you cut into a brisket or something, that's that you go somewhere to eat or that you smoke, usually there's like a, a quarter inch pink line around the outside of the meat from where it's been <laughs> smoked i'm just reading some of the comments once again <laughs> lincoln i would eat that brisket and I, I it's probably great i wouldn't say a word i he would serve that to me and i'd be it's like got a great bark on it i'll say that i i would be like this is delicious thanks man you're the best but okay i gotta read some of these comments <laughs> This guy says, Mike Martin says, Jesus Christ, there's more moisture in the Sahara Desert. <laughs> I mean, what? Taylor Pryor says, overcooked and no smoke ring. Did you place this over a propane grill for five hours? Completely ruined a good piece of meat. Like, is it really that bad? I don't know is what I'm saying. Like, I have absolutely zero experience oh, in this field. Like, I, I've, I've never done it. I've never done it. So, but by the, based on the comments, people are rather critical <laughs> of the product. I'm just saying, I, I was reading through the comments. I was, I, I literally read through the comments for 15 straight minutes. They're hilarious. I know. And here's the funny thing about that. As soon as he responded to someone that said, is it me or does this look dry or whatever the, the tweet was? Then everyone, I don't know how many people follow him, probably a couple hundred thousand, but as soon as everyone saw that, oh, he's looking through the comments, everyone's going to just turn their game up uh, to a hundred at that point. That's great. Jim Eagle <laughs> says, ah, jerky for Easter, non-traditional. <laughs> I like it. It's like, I mean, what? These people are, these people are brutal, man. <laughs> Barbecue Twitter. Uh, you don't want to mess Brutal. with barbecue Twitter, man. Brutal. Smother it with barbecue sauce. You'll be fine. Yeah. That's great. I don't give a damn how good he <laughs> is at cooking. The guy can call plays. He's a hell of a coach. Oh, that's so funny, though. It's that is so great. Good. Okay. Now we'll get to the running back stuff. We had to talk about it, though. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's all over my Twitter right now. Okay. Running backs. Let's start with Kennedy Brooks. Then they are saying so far through spring ball, he looks like the exact same guy. He looks exactly the same as when he opted out. He continues to just be a steady back, but he still doesn't have great explosiveness, right? Uh, doesn't have what I like to call juice, but he makes up for a lack of juice by having a really good feel on the field. Uh, he he has some of the best vision you'll see at the running back position. And, and the coaches talk about ju just how good of a feel, how good that vision is, and how that sets him up for success. He just understands the timing of everything in Lincoln Riley's offense. So 
if any OU fans were worried that maybe he wouldn't be the same running back, it sounds like he's the exact same guy and they don't need to be worried at all. Yeah. I wonder, because I agree, his, he's almost the perfect back because he doesn't have that juice and the fact that he's a little bit slower, methodical runner works out perfectly with some of the timing stuff that, that OU has. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I always say about him and I, and I hate for this to be taken as a knock on him, it's really not, but most of his explosive runs, he's 10 or 12 yards downfield before he ever even like there, there's even a defender there ready for him, which says a heck of a lot about Oklahoma's offensive line and, and their play calling and just their offense in general. But I wonder what type of year do you think he would have had last year with some of the offensive line struggles? Do you think it would have been a, uh, you think he would have helped the offensive line out or because of his more patient nature, do you think it, last year that would have been a negative for him? It would have made things worse. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I'd like to think that he would have helped just because I always think having more veteran players always helps. But there's a couple games, that offense line, they didn't play well at all, right? Whoever would have played a running back wouldn't have had much chance. So I do think you look at what Kennedy Brooks' numbers have looked like throughout his career, I think his averages would be down for sure. Yeah. I, I definitely – so I, I think that he would have – he certainly – would have had a better feel, especially at the start of the year, than like McGowan for the GT counter stuff. But just with the way that they played in some of those games up front, you have to think that he wouldn't have had as explosive a year because they didn't have as good of a year overall just running the football. And the running back can only do so much. He's never been a guy that can make a bunch of guys miss in the hole or anything like that. So I, I, I don't know, but I think it probably would have been just about where it ended up, right? Yeah, that's probably right. It probably would have helped the offensive line out quite a bit early. Yeah. You know, whenever Ramondre came in late, it seemed like they started playing a little bit better, and you got to think that, th that he had something to do with that. The interesting thing about Kennedy with me is I don't know that I consider him a total back. He's obviously really good with the ball in his hands in some of their running schemes. I would even say that there's like the GT counter and stuff like that is his real strength. Uh, I, pr maybe he's a good zone runner. Just haven't seen a whole heck of a lot of that from him. And we haven't seen them use him very much in the passing game. And I, I just, I just wonder if he's the most complete back that we have. I don't know. I think he's probably the best runner like straight up yards per carry guy but is he the best blocker he's the best out of the backfield just kind of the the total back I don't I don't know that he's he's that guy it's interesting that you bring that up because Eric Gray comes in from Tennessee definitely still adjusting to the offense right learning the intricacies of it learning the terminology but Ted I've been told that He's absorbing everything really well. And a few of the coaches feel that he is going to be the guy that ends up being their best overall back, right? A, a guy that they feel comfortable with, with all the run schemes, guy they feel comfortable with throwing the screen game to, uh, throwing some passes to out of the backfield, even putting him in the slot, letting him run routes from there. Now, I, I don't think he has quite the feel for the offense yet like Kenny Dew Brooks has. But that's understandable, right? You just got there. When you look at this kid's talent, he's got some juice, right? He, he's, anybody that has watched his stuff from Tennessee knows that he's got a little giddy up to him. But he, he is definitely going to be a big contributor for this offense, which is exactly why they brought him in, right? So he's already shown that he's going to be a guy that plays a lot of snaps for this team. Yeah, and – that's we need a back that is a threat out of the backfield and a, a threat running the football 
it always helps so much to have a guy that that could do everything. Defense is key on that, man. Whenever whenever you got six, seven games of history of when a guy's in the game, you throw more versus when an, another guy's in, you run more. Those things matter. And defense is key on that. So uh, when you have a guy that could do absolutely everything, it's awesome. And, you know, I'm, I'm just – I'm interested, you know, because – Kennedy Brooks has a lot of carries in this offense, but he doesn't have any carries in this offense for DeMarco Murray. So while he has some history coming in, I still look at this spring as a clean slate for him, almost as if he's a a transfer, so to speak, because he hasn't played for his, for the running back coach. So there's no real, there's no real preconceived notion or, idea of what he's going to be whenever you plug him in you kind of got to impress your coach all over again so wonder you know what that means if anything for some of the rep structure throughout spring it's definitely a open competition Uh, I think that anyone that thinks that Kennedy Brooks is just going to be the number one back with no questions asked I just I just don't think it's going to be that way. So you're, you're right. It's, it is different, you know, different coach you know, that is looking at different things, right? DeMarco views things differently than Jay Bulware did. So yeah, it'll be interesting. But one guy that we were really hoping would make a big jump, Ted, is Seth McGowan. We've, we've talked about the expectation for him from last year to this year, right? Expecting that big jump between his freshman and sophomore season. He's got all the talent, right? Seems like a physical freak from a strength and explosiveness standpoint. Has good speed, I wouldn't say. He's got great speed, but his ability to change direction, the violence he runs the football with, but it's difficult to make a big jump when you're constantly banged up and that's what's happening with Seth Seth McGowan and it's hard to rely on a guy that is consistently dealing with something that's bothering him so I don't really know what to think for Seth McGowan moving forward we've seen flashes right where the kid can do a lot of things and I, I just don't know. Like if if he's always dealing with some issue, does he get passed by by other guys? Because you know, everyone's heard, you know, the best abilities availability. That applies at every position. If you're in and out of the lineup, you're in and out of practice a lot, eventually coaches are going to feel like they have to rely on other guys. And then those guys get more reps. Now, I'm not saying Seth McGowan's just going to disappear for this football team but ultimately he got to get healthy man that's that's the issue for him he's got to get healthy he's got to stay healthy because we know he can contribute he's got the talent but man it's just it's just hard when you when you can't stay on the practice field there's no doubt about it you've got to be a dependable football player and and that isn't just um injury wise health wise being dependable because some of that stuff's going to happen i mean when you're playing a violent sport like football you're going to get banged up every now and then you're going to roll an ankle you're going to take a shoulder some of that that stuff's going to happen but you got to be dependable uh, in a sense that if you do miss time you the mental reps and the mental aspect of the game you don't lose a step you stay up to pace and there's there's not a, a another period where you've missed time and you come back and you got to work back in and the coach has to bring you up to speed on everything. You've got to be dependable. And that's everything. That's that's health, that's technique, that's understanding the offense, that's ball security, that's grades, that's what you're doing away from the the program. You've got to be a dependable football player. We know that Seth McGowan has all the tools to be an outstanding running back, you could probably say of everyone in the room, he's probably the most overall talented guy in there. But 
you know, does he check all those other boxes that I just men mentioned? And as of right now, the answer to that is no. And when you're in a room as deep as this one is, where you've got veteran guys ahead of you, um, they brought in a, another guy from another position. All of a sudden, it's a crowded room. And even in a system with Lincoln Riley, who loves to give the ball to multiple guys throughout a season, it's going to be hard to, to get carries if you're not dependable. Yeah, especially with a guy like Mikey Henderson in the running back room. Now, uh, he goes out of the H-back room, and he is now in the room with DeMarco Murray. The coaches feel that this guy has a huge upside at this position, and he's leaned down a little bit now as a running back and clearly is talented out of the backfield. We saw that last year with some of the two-back stuff that they did with him, but he's also a guy that you can hand it to, and they think he can really come along as a guy that you just turn and hand the football to in their traditional run game. He's big. He's powerful. He can run through contact. He can make guys miss. But one area they think they can really excel with him is using him to run routes. So, Ted, we always talk about how – when guys can do multiple things, when a running back can all of a sudden bump out the wide receiver, it can mess with defenses and what personnel they have on the field. But he is showing an ability to bump out to the slot, bump out to these receiver positions and run crisp routes. And that can make life very, very difficult for a defense. So he's not a guy that they're just going to use out of the backfield I think with some of the things they've seen the first couple of weeks of spring ball, they feel really good about lining him up in multiple positions as a receiver and letting him just run kind of some traditional wide receiver routes. Yeah. I, and I think he, I think you can hand him the football. He's with a year of H back under his belt. You could trust him in pass pro. Uh, you, you think that he'd have a real knack for that, obviously. And we've seen him run routes. We've seen him do a good job, uh, whether it's out of the backfield of kind of that offset, uh, you know, 20 personnel look with the two split backs uh, look really good. He's incredibly athletic. I like Mikey Henderson a lot. I think he may be, I think he may be the, the guy of this group that really shows up and se separates himself and just said, you know, every now and then there's, there's, uh, a guy that comes into the room, it's like, ah, you know, he's he he's always showing up on film. He's always doing the right things. We got to find a way to get him on the field. I feel like that's Mikey Henderson. He also looks like a Clydesdale in a room full of ponies right now. Whenever you look at that room, he's 6'2", 225, 230 pounds. Uh, everyone else in there is, there's some smaller guys. You know, they're all under six foot tall. Uh, Kennedy Brooks is a little bit heavier, but you know, whenever you're talking about uh, like Gray, he's he's like a 5'10", 200 pounder. So compared to compared to Eric Gray and and Seth McGowan, Mikey Henderson looks like a giant in there. So whenever you've got that and he can do all the things that you ask of him, it's like, gosh dang, we got to get this guy on the field, whether it's short yardage or uh, as a blocking spot. Some of that twin backs looks. I, there's there's just a lot of different things that you could do with him. And that's the great versatility coming from that H-back spot. You love it, man. It, whenever there's more that you could do on a football field, you end up finding your way out there. Maybe they create a position for you. Maybe they create a, a package for you. But whenever you could do that much stuff, you get reps. And I feel like that's what's going to happen to Mikey Henderson. Yeah, completely agree. And then last guy. I'm going to talk about in that running back room. Marcus Major, really like his skill set, right? Did some really good things. Got a lot of people's attention with what he did in the Cotton Bowl. And he does a lot of things well. But he just doesn't have a standout characteristic. And when you're in a crowded room, you have to have something that makes you stand out. And, and I still believe that Marcus Major would be a 
thousand yard back a lot of places. Probably start at almost every place in the Big 12 except for Oklahoma. And I'm not sure how much he's going to get on the field. Right. I just, yeah. I, I don't know. Because when you look at this room, there's just not much of an opportunity to get a ton of snaps if you don't stand out. And I just don't think he stands out. He, he's a great guy to add depth to a running back room. Like he's a guy you want on your team. There's no doubt about it. He, he can play, but when you look at Kennedy Brooks being back and now Eric Gray's in the mix and now Mikey Henderson's in that room and you got Seth McGowan, if he's healthy, being able to do like, it's just tough, man. It's competitive. And I, I, I just don't know if he's ever going to be a significant contributor while he's at OU. I, I, I just don't know. Yeah, no, I agree with that. You know, you, you're always uh, an injury or a suspension or something like that from being right there about to be thrust into the mix. So he does give us some outstanding depth, but I agree. I, for whatever reason, I think Marcus major has a great skill set. I think he's a good all around back. I think he's, he's kind of like a, uh, he's like, he's almost like a version of Eric gray. You know, they're similar in size, uh, guys that can really do uh, pretty much everything, but I don't think he's as explosive, you know, on some of those plays where it's like, Oh man, just one tackle away or a uh, one cut from, from turning it back and going 40 or 50 yards. It's like, he's, he's always just right there and, and can't quite make that play. So yeah, I, I think he would start almost anywhere in college football outside of a handful of programs. And unfortunately I think Oklahoma is one of those. Yeah. And for our call your shot question, we asked the listeners, what running back are you most excited about for OU and at Austin elite 35 on Twitter says Eric gray, my Tennessee friend compared him to Alvin Kamara. I think half a Camara in Riley's offense would bring the offense to a different level. If he could be half a Camara, I'm all for it. Well, he's about half a Camara in size. So at that point we're, we're getting close to it. Yeah. If, if he's anything like Camara, we'd be who I can't even imagine. <laughs> we'd, we'd be just fine. Offensively. Right. Uh, Brian Swatzenbarg on Twitter says, I'd like to say gray because I think he's going to be great in this offense, but I'm most excited to see what Mikey Henderson is going to be this year and how he will be used. That's I can see right him answer. hitting. I can see him hitting a crease or catching a pass in a big game and taking it to the house. He's electric Swatson Barg. I think you're onto something, man. I do. Yep. They're really excited about him. I mean, the combination of being able to catch the ball out of the backfield, being physical enough to mix it up as a blocker, uh, getting downhill. I would, I really hope we get to see him run some mid zone, some outside zone where they get him going downhill. He can stick his toe to the ground, make one cut and get North and South. I think he'd be great in that type of scheme, but yeah, he, he could be, one of those guys where at the end of the year, we're like, holy shit, this guy is going to be a monster. Here's what I think is going to happen with him. I, I think he's going to be, I think he'll start off in kind of like the Trey Sermon role where you got a couple of backs. You probably have Kennedy Brooks as your, your go-to uh, carry guy. Uh, Gray is probably your go-to all around guy. They're probably going to share the majority of the reps. Um, I bet Mikey Henderson's probably in on 20 personnel with either Kennedy or Eric Gray. But when you get a lead and you get into the second half, into the fourth quarter, I think Mikey Henderson's going to be your your pound at home guy, your four minute offense guy. And uh, whenever that happens, you got a good offensive line that's wearing on a, a tired defense. A lot of those runs you know, that are typically, you know, four or five yard carries, a good fresh back that's big and size like that can run through those tackles, turn them into explosive plays. So 
I think that's probably going to be his role early on because Lincoln's shown that he likes to have a guy like that, a closer. Yeah. Well, Parker Burnett on Twitter says, Kennedy Brooks. I don't think people remember just how good that dude is. Dude has rushed for over 1,000 yards in each season and is somehow underrated by his own fan base. His seven and a half yards per carry is, checks notes, best in OU history. <laughs> Pretty wild, which that is... Parker Burnett, I'm, I'm just going to trust you there on that stat. That is pretty crazy to think about that if this guy leads the program in yards per carry ever, that yeah. we're not a little more excited about. We're excited. We're excited to have Kennedy Brooks back. Like, we're excited, but I think there's a couple couple guys that are a little more explosive in the room. That's all I'm saying. We're excited it's for good Kennedy thing. Brooks. That's a good thing. Exactly. Whenever you've got depth like that. Okay, Ted, let's move on to football guys talking basketball. But first, First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma, tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And guys, spring is here and you know what that means. It's hard seltzer season. There's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast, and that is Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer from Coop Ale Works. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool, at the lake, and at the tailgate. It's made in Oklahoma, and it is absolutely delicious. I dare you to try the mango guava and say it's not incredible. Will and Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in a store near you, and go follow them on social media at, at Will and Wiley. One quick Oklahoma State football note. They had their pro day. Some impressive results for what I like to call their big three for the upcoming NFL draft, and that's Tylen Wallace, Tevin Jenkins, and Chuba Hubbard. Tylen Wallace, he crushed it at the Senior Bowl, especially with his route running. People still kind of questioned how fast he was. Ted, I, I got this stuff from Jim Nagy there, the executive director at the Senior Bowl, who had scouts there timing these guys. And he ran four five two and a four four eight in his two forties. Those are great times for him. Now he's not the biggest guy in the world. Everyone knows that, but that it makes a little more sense now why he ran by so many people in college. The guy can go four four eight. I mean that is that's moving. It's good. It's another another good number. Um, the numbers being thrown out there this year by some guys all over the country are impressive. There's some great times being thrown down, which, you know, we talked about this is a huge advantage having your combine numbers be from pro day place where you're comfortable running. Uh, a lot of it's not on laser time. So there's going to be some faster times, which is a good thing. Um, and, you know, Tyler Wallace, all you got to do is click on the tape, see him running by people like you mentioned and going up and making acrobatic catches. Um, too bad that it's, it seems like every single year the draft at wide receiver is so incredibly deep. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea when he's going to get drafted. I don't know if he's a day two guy. I would think he's a day two guy, but I know one thing. I'd want him on my team. I like the way that that guy plays. I like the way he competes and turns out he's pretty fast. Okay. Tevin Jenkins, a lot of people have him mocked in the first round, slim down a little bit, 317 pounds for Tevin Jenkins when he weighed in, but also ran a 5040. So big man can move 32 and a half inch vert for Tevin Jenkins, which I think caught a lot of people's attention they were like wait okay so he is that type of explosive bench 225 36 times that i think tevin jenkins just might have cemented himself as a first round draft pick with that performance those are some impressive numbers impressive numbers yet again i'm seeing them all over the place we don't have enough of these type of numbers at ou 
We need more numbers like this for guys going to the next level. Yeah. Just Not shows too up you. too often, right? I mean, it's – I'm looking all over the country. Pitts, Kyle Pitts is running 4-4, and uh, LSU's got guys running – sub four, four, and it's all over the place. We've got to have more stuff like that at Oklahoma. We need more of those type of athletes and we need to develop uh, the guys that we've got on campus a little bit better. Yeah. Chuba Hubbard, 210 pounds goes four, five, Oh, four, four, eight. We knew we could run. That wasn't surprising. 36 inch vert, 20 bench reps, which that's a good number for Chuba, but this just in, yeah, that guy's he's kind of a physical freak. I have no idea where he's going to get drafted, what round, but it it was a nice reminder. I saw the numbers. I was like, "Oh yeah, remember when that guy was like supposed to win the Heisman or at least be in the conversation and then didn't have much of a year, but he was able to get right for pro day and put on a little bit of a show." So, it's obviously hindsight, but probably should have gone in the draft. You know, I think that's had, had a year where he, a lot of people thought he should have been invited to the Heisman over 2000 yards, uh, was shocked a lot of people by coming back, but, um, you know, it's, it's more difficult at running back than maybe any other position to, to really stand out and get to that first round spot. Usually only one guy there, maybe two on a special year. So it's a, it's a tough position, but. He put up some good numbers, and I think he'll make a good back in the NFL. I do, too. I do, too. I mean, he's he's got all the physical tools, needs to improve his blocking, which is kind of the first thing, right, for rookie running backs, where you better be able to pick, up, pick it up in blitz protection or you will not play because they don't want quarterbacks getting killed. But uh, I think Chuba, he's, he's the type of athlete that plays running back in the NFL. That's just the truth. Okay, Ted, football guys talking basketball, FGTB. We got to start Porter Moser. It's Moser, right? That's how, that's what the press release said. M O Z E R Moser. So not Moser. I've been saying Moser. I think everyone's been saying Moser, but it's Moser. Moser. That's because the Z is in the pronunciation guide. So Moser. So Porter Moser hired as Oklahoma basketball's new coach. He took now I will give loyal, loyal of Chicago, some credit. They tried their best to keep this man, right? Offered him a 10 year deal reportedly, uh, I guess offered him a ton of money for a mid major. Like they were finding people to donate money. Like, Hey, we got to pay this guy. We got to keep him here. But Josie, Made him an offer he couldn't refuse, right? I know that's cliche, but he was Moser was one of the hottest names out there, maybe the hottest name out there for all of these coaching coaching vacancies. He was at the top of all the lists because of what he's done at Loyola Chicago the last four seasons. He won three of four uh, Missouri Valley Conference regular season titles, went to the Sweet 16 this season, and of course, everyone remembers their run to the final four back in 2018. Oh, you clearly targeted him for the success his teams have had in the last couple of years on the court. But Teddy, it sounds like this is a perfect fit character wise that he, he is a good fit for the OU culture. And that's important. Uh, I think Joe Castiglione values that over damn near everything else. So sounds like this guy is going to run a clean program and do everything the right way. Well, we heard Fran Frischilla say it the other day, when you're at a football school, you got to run it clean because you can't have the NCAA snooping around. And um, I'll just tell you, honestly, whenever the name first came out that he was a target, and I looked into it. I just, uh, I, I, I wasn't too sure about it. You know, whenever you, he's got a, a long history of being a head coach. And for most of it, his teams weren't very good. I don't think he had a winning record in, in conference 
until that final four run. That was the first year he had a winning record in conference since like 2002 as a head coach and never finished higher than fifth in their conference until that final four run. So my big complaint was, well, what, what has changed? All of a sudden he's he'd been average, had average teams forever. What changed? And I didn't know, honestly, I'm asking the question, show it to me. And um, finally, Toby told me that he, he credits his change of, of coaching style and everything that he did with his time with Rick Majerus. Um, he was a really good coach, took Utah to the Final Four, and he was an assistant for him for four or five years, I think, at St. Louis, and learned a bunch of really good stuff from him. And uh, obviously, that's like his mentor. That's who he's going to reference in pretty much everything that he, he does. So that is – once I saw all that stuff, I started feeling better about it because I'll tell you, a Final Four and a Sweet 16 at Loyola Chicago, that's impressive. And seems like a great guy, just like you mentioned, going to do everything the right way. We'll see, man. It's going to be tough in the Big 12. It's going to be tough. We've got, as of right now, a bunch of guys transferring out and, you know, really good coaches, really good athletes in this league. So it's going to be a thin margin for error. Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're an OU fan, don't look into – Porter Mosier's time at Illinois State. Just just pretend like that <laughs> didn't happen. That's how he ended up, right? At St. Louis. Yeah. So, but I I trust Joe Castiglione. I do, right? And it is going to be interesting to see how he recruits. That that's that's important. And we know that college basketball recruiting, there there's some shady stuff that goes on it. Like everyone knows that that's, that's common knowledge. And Joe Castiglione is not going to let his coach do that. He's just not. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of players they can attract. I, I certainly think that this guy's got a great reputation with what he's done at Loyola Chicago the last couple of years, right? I went down a YouTube rabbit hole of watching him teach some of the, some of the defensive principles that they use there. And that's what they're known for that defense right now. They can, scored the basketball and everything, but they were the best defensive team in the country this season. Teddy, just remember one phrase, help with the hip, help with the hip. You'll hear him say that a lot. I'm guessing help. Nice. With I the like hip. it. You mentioned guys transferring out Brady Manick. And this made me sad. It did the pride of Harrow, Oklahoma. He has entered the transfer portal, a really good four year career for the Sooners four year starter just never really improved much from his freshman year. Let's be really just, he was really good as a freshman. We all thought that he was going to continue to get better and didn't really see a jump, right? It was steady. Don't get me wrong. Was a really steady player for them. Unfortunately, this year is probably his worst season, right? With some of the ups and downs that he had, but wish this guy the best of luck. And he's in the, He's in the portal. That doesn't mean he's necessarily gone, right? But I I really hope that if he does end up somewhere else that he kills it. I I love the Oklahoma kids. You know that, Teddy. And I I, I just wish him the best. Yeah. I you know, I to see him transfer is it's bittersweet in a sense because Manic, you're used to seeing him out there. I like Brady Manic a lot. Uh, I think he's got a beautiful shot. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like he could go somewhere and really flourish. I, I think the pressure here is is a lot. Uh, I think a smaller venue, a smaller uh, – you, you kind of hide away a little bit. You know, he's not a big personality. But I do have a bit of a theory, you know, Porter Mosier plays with a true big guy. He's had Crutwig in there as a true big guy. Brady Manick, for at, at least the last two years, has been playing out of position. He's been playing a, a five at times, a four or five. I, you know, I, Toby disagrees with me. Toby thinks he's a, a four or stretch four. I think, I think Brady Manick's a three. I think he's a, 
I think he's he's a three guy. He's a hangout on the. Well, the problem is he can't guard a three. That's the like he doesn't right. have that type of athleticism to guard the opponent's three. So I I know what you're saying though. Like his offensive skill set certainly he plays offensively like a perimeter player. That's right. that's how he plays. He he's the stand in the corner guy, and if you kick out and he hits the three. The know? Andre Robertson, but he actually <laughs> makes the three. <laughs> right, but you know I. So I guess my, my thought is that if you're Porter Mosier, you go to, you go to Brady Manick and you say, listen, you're not a five. I'm not going to ask you to do things that a five does. I, and I would guess that Porter Mosier is going to go out in the transfer portal and find, find a big man to come in and play that role. And Brady's not going to have to play that role anymore. Cause I don't blame the kid for, for not wanting to, not wanting to do that, you know, not wanting to bang in the big 12 against a bunch of really good big guys. And that's just not his thing. That's not what he's good at. One of, and it always hurt. It always hurt me to see it, but like he'd be battling some monster in the post and they'd score and he'd just like drop his head. Like, damn it. Like what, what am I supposed to do? And I was was like, I don't know what he's supposed to do. It just, yeah, you're right. And I think that takes a toll on his shot. You know, he's it takes his toll on you mentally, right? When you're like, I'm gonna have to battle this dude that is bigger and stronger than me for 40 minutes. This is going to suck. It's probably not very fun going into a game thinking that. No, mentally, physically, everything. It just it's it's tough to bang with with those big guys down there whenever you know he's not a, a he doesn't have a big physical imposing uh you know frame. So it it just I hate it for him. I hope he finds a place where he can play in position and, and do what he's best at. Yeah, me too. Okay, let's recap the Final Four, and let's start with the boring game. Baylor came out and punched Houston straight in the mouth, and the game was over. I mean, that's that's exactly what happened. Now, Houston just couldn't f- keep up with Baylor offensively. Houston had a couple stretches in the first half where they went like four plus minutes without scoring at all. And you just can't do that against this Baylor team. You just can't. Now I will give Marcus Sasser some credit. He did his part, but the rest of Houston's team was just not existent. Baylor was on fire from three in the first half. Jared Butler was looking like himself and you, you look at it, and Baylor ends up having five guys scoring double figures. They just overwhelmed Kelvin Sampson's squad with their balance offensively. But once again, the thing that really stands out about this Baylor team to me is their activity on the defensive end of the floor. Now, Houston missed some shots. Don't get me wrong, Ted, but Baylor was everywhere defensively. They were just constantly moving. They were constantly pressuring Houston, and they did not handle handle it well. Just a dominant performance by Scott Drew's team. Yeah, whenever you can defend like Baylor, most teams it's like either or. You know, like Houston's a great defensive team, but they don't score a whole heck of a lot. Well, Baylor's a great defensive team, and they're like number three in the country in scoring, you know, uh, behind Gonzaga at number one. Uh, they overwhelm you with great guard play. They've got depth coming off the bench. Just a good, solid, all-around basketball team that, you know, they're good whenever they're they're inconsistent a little bit. But whenever they're hitting on all cylinders, they're almost impossible to beat. And you go back to what uh, Coach Frischilla told us, you know, this stretch has given them time to – actually get in and practice some and, you know, actually, cause they, they had such a long stretch where they couldn't do anything. I think they're finally getting their legs back at the right time. Yeah. They look great. They looked fantastic and shout out to Baylor because now I still had the game on in the second half. Don't get me wrong, but we were hosting Easter. So, you know, we needed to start some prep, get it, get a few things done. And that second half allowed us to, I, once again, I was in the kitchen, you know, organizing some things, getting the platters that my wife said, Hey, you got to get this, this, and this I'm, I'm doing what I'm told, but I really didn't have to pay that close of attention to the game. Cause that thing was over yeah. in the first half. And I was like, okay, this is kind of nice. 
And then the second game came. <laughs> and it was an absolute classic between Gonzaga and UCLA. It, an awesome back and forth game. I know the game will be remembered for the end of regulation and then the fantastic finish in overtime, but hopefully people will remember just how fantastic the game was up to that point too, because it, yeah. I, I mean, it was a classic. The sequence where Jalen Suggs blocks the Riley kids dunk. He makes the pass, which the, the pass was better awesome. than the block. I agree. And the, and then Timmy finishes it with the dunk and then the, the mustache <laughs> celebration, which I, is an all timer in college basketball. You, you look at that sequence. It was like basketball pornography. almost. <laughs> I watched it. And I was like, Oh wow. Oh my. <laughs> but you, you look at this game and then Timmy takes the charge at the end of the regulation at the end of regulation, which I thought was, you know, took some, Took some onions to do that. Good call too, though. I know some people made it. It was a good call. I, thought, it, I mean, this is the yeah. right call. So the first overtime Final Four game since 1998. Wow. So yeah, that they said that on the broadcast. I was like, what? That could be wrong. I could have just made that up. But I, I, I had a few seltzers when I wrote it's that broadcast note down. Fault at this point, you know, we just push it onto them. I put it on Jim Nance. That's <laughs> that's what he gets. But. You look at that overtime, Drew Timmy went to work early. Uh, the Sug shot to win it is right up there with the Chris Jenkins Villanova shot as the best NCAA tournament moments of my lifetime. I mean, it was, he let it go. It went in and I was screaming. And I, I didn't care who won that game. I didn't care at all, but what? a classic moment for college basketball. W one of the best moments that th they just don't get much better than that, man. No, and it was, and it was a great play UCLA to get the tie. Was it Campbell who got the tie for them? I think it was Juzang, right? Because Maybe he so. shot it and then got his own rebound and laid it back right. in, right? Or laid it back in. Um, and you know, they're going flying back up the floor really quickly. I mean, I thought that was great by them. Get the ball back in. Don't sit back and think and wait. Just go ahead and attack. And UCLA, they had like three or four guys just kind of in the center of the floor. No idea what was going on. I think they expected um, uh, Gonzaga to slow down a little bit and try and set something up. Uh, just totally took them by surprise. So we flew up that wing and, and hit that shot. You've got to see the videos of it must have been out there in Westwood, people watching wherever it was, watching UCLA going crazy whenever they tied it up. The whole place goes nuts, and then it's like, oh, my God, what just happened? It's pretty cool. That was a great ending to a game, though, man. That and, was... I, you know, honestly, I, I didn't think UCLA was going to be able to hang in there with Gonzaga. They played great. They were fantastic. I was stunned. If you that, hadn't seen either team play all year, there's no way that you would suggest that UCLA is an 11 seed in a play-in game. Remember the chores I talked about that I was accomplishing in the second half of the Baylor game? I thought <laughs> I was going to get more shit done, Teddy, in the second half of this game. And all of a sudden you look at it, I was like, well, nope, I am, I am planting my cheeks on the couch and we are watching this one. And it was, I mean, what a finish, what a moment. And I, I hope that I hope that the final lives up to it. And I think it's going to be awesome. We've I got it Monday wait. night. Let's go. This is the can't game. Wait. This is the game that everyone has wanted. Everyone that's a college basketball fan has been looking forward to this matchup. And when you look at the matchup, when I watched Gonzaga UCLA, Gonzaga they 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 could not guard. Hawkes and Juze. They just didn't have an answer for him. And, and those guys went off offensively. And you you mentioned Tiger Campbell. He was giving them fits as well. Well, when I look at Baylor, I think Jared Butler and Davion Mitchell and Macy Oteague can give them similar fits. And I think those three guys are better than Campbell, Hawkes, and Juze. So I wonder how Scott Drew is going to attack 
Gonzaga offensively after seeing what those guys from UCLA were able to accomplish. I wonder what adjustments Mark Few is going to make defensively, knowing that Baylor is going to watch what those guys from UCLA just did to him. But I'm not sure Baylor has anyone that can guard Drew Timmy consistently. Mm -hmm. And you look at what Corey Kispert does, the way that he stretches the floor. If Mark Vidal has to guard Kispert, that's going to put Mark Vidal possibly in a few uncomfortable situations for him defensively. Now they switch everything. Baylor and, and Vital prides himself on what he can do when it comes to on-ball defense, but he's going to have to chase Kispert around a little bit. And, well, man, Mark Vital, he's, he's a hell of a player, but he's not a long-distance runner. And if Kispert's running around all over the place and he's having to chase him, that could be, that could be interesting. But, Ted, all year I've been saying that when Baylor is rolling – they are the best team in the country. I still feel that way. I even feel more confident after watching their game against Houston. Give me the Baylor Bears to cut down the nets Monday night. Gonzaga is a four-and-a-half-point favorite. I will take the points, and I will take Baylor straight up. Give me the Bears in what I'm hoping is a classic. Wow. Would that be the first time since what? Oh, eight, a big 12 team has won Kansas. Oh, yeah. eight Chalmers. Um, I, my heart says Baylor. My head says Gonzaga. I, I really like Baylor. I do. I think that this game is going to be, I, I think it's, totally even match these teams can both score they can both defend they're both deep they can get points from uh, a bunch of different guys I think it's just going to come down to who can have the most consistent game who doesn't go out and try and do too much and I feel like Gonzaga has they've looked totally relaxed to me I know they've got the undefeated season on the line it doesn't look like it. it looks like a team that's playing free and clear and confident. Unfortunately, I'm pulling for Baylor, but I think Gonzaga wins. Well, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. I will say this. Gonzaga just played an overtime game, right? That'll take a toll on you. And it was a, it was a back and forth game the entire time, right? You go back and look at it what, 15 ties, 19 lead changes. That was a physically taxing game they played against UCLA and also an emotionally taxing game with it going to overtime with that sug shot. Like, that takes it out of you. Man, I know these kids are young, but you only got one day to recover. And Not then, just physically, mentally, too. The absolutely. roller coasters, all the lead changes, just the stress of playing in a game like that. So while Baylor was in cruise control for the entire second half, almost for damn near that whole game, right? Gonzaga just went through the ringer against UCLA. So I, that's why I, I think that gives Baylor an advantage as well. But you got the Zags. I got the Bears. Only one will be correct. I say we bet a dozen uh, cookie princess cookies on it. Deal. Straight up. I have to drive them out I'm to not, your house. That's a no, long we'll drive. We'll figure man. out a way to get it done. Okay. We'll figure out yeah, a way we'll to get it done. All right. That's that's far. You live out there. Okay. Well, your house is the same distance from mine, Gabe. So well, you yeah, but I live there. in civilization. <laughs> I live I live by people. You got to send it out to my house, like on on horseback. You know, that's the only way you can get it. Now, I can ride a horse. I may not be able to smoke meats, but I can ride a damn horse. <laughs> I'm, and I, like, decently well, too. Okay. Very comfortable on really? a horse. Very comfortable. Okay, good. My mom will tell you a story where I went through about a full year phase as a child where I was convinced I was going to be a cowboy. Like, straight really? up convinced that I was going to be a cowboy. I wore a cowboy hat, a denim shirt jeans cowboy boots and like a handkerchief like in my pocket or sometimes even around the neck when I was feeling fancy 
for an entire Whoa. year as a kid. Whoa. There is there is a school picture that can prove that this story is true. I wore it for my school picture, dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That beats my story. I was just going to say I was once bucked off a horse and it stepped on my stomach. Oh, that was were you okay? Brutal. I was okay. I was a bit shaken up. But no, dude, okay. that'll scare you. Dude, you yeah, get I was more scared than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to beat your business's specific needs. I think I said beat. I meant meet your business's specific <laughs> needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And also, March is here, and the madness has officially begun. It's time for you to shoot your shot and score big on the nonstop action with my bookie. Select the winners from 63 tournament games in the MyBookie Bracket Contest for a chance at $10,000 in cash prizes, and it's only a dollar to enter. It doesn't matter whether you're filling out multiple brackets, betting the national championship winner, or simply, look simply looking for player and game props, MyBookie has you covered. Sign up today at MyBookie.ag and use promo code OKLAHOMA to secure a deposit up to $1,000. That's promo code OKLAHOMA to claim your first deposit bonus. College ball, NBA, and NHL, no matter the sport, no matter the minute, from tip-off to buzzer, my bookie puts the action in your hands with in-game live betting. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Okay, Ted, who do you have as your winner of the weekend? My winner is Skip Bayless. It's amazing to me. Did you see his tweet after the game? He says, no idea how you can call that an all-time great game when it was won by a lucky shot. Now, here's a guy that gets paid millions of dollars. For what? I don't know exactly, but whether it's Twitter, whether it's live on his show, it's just a never-ending spew of horrible takes. It doesn't matter what topic, does not matter, yet the guy continues to make millions it's the damnedest thing i've ever seen in my life he is unbelievably skilled at getting a reaction out of people mm -hmm. and that is valuable i guess and i'm with you i don't watch skip bayless's show I wish I made what Skip Bayless makes for doing what he does. It, there must be a reason that they pay him that much money, right? And they uh, just re-upped him, right? They just re-upped him. There's not a reason. A, a lot of people can say it, it's easy to be the, the, you know, the naysayer, the opposite guy, whenever everyone's saying something is unbelievable and you come in and be the well actually guy. Everyone else on the planet gets shooed away as a moron whenever that happens, especially if it happens consistently. But somehow, because of his platform, I guess he's able to get away with it. I don't know. I, don't I have know. no idea. But I have no idea. He's the winner, man. He's the winner. Making so much money. And the, the worst part, and you and I have talked about this before. We have talked about the fact that we could come on here on this podcast and just say outlandish bullshit that we do not believe <laughs> and people, and it would get a reaction and we, we'd probably get more downloads and more attention, but we have not been able to get ourselves to do that. It's just not how we're wired. 
I don't know if I hate Skip Bayless or you respect have dignity. him. You know, that's why you don't do I, that. To to be able to say things publicly that you do not believe. Like that you and there's no way that you actually believe them, but you know it's going to get a reaction out of people and you know it's going to turn into a clip that spreads like wildfire on Twitter. I don't know if I respect it or I hate it. I think it's a little bit of both. But that's what he does, right? There's yeah. no way he believes all this stuff he says. Like, there's just no way. There's no way. Right? But, but maybe he here's does. The thing. Once you convince someone that you're stupid, there's no going back. No amount of, of whatever you say, however many times you're right from that point forward, there's no going back from that point on. So to me, I think that's uh, that's more valuable than even, I guess, the millions that Skip Bayless is getting. I don't know. He said the shot was pure luck, Ted. <laughs> pure luck. Okay. I did not expect Skip Bayless talk tonight, yeah. and here we are. Look at us. Hey, look that's at him. He's the winner, right? That's why he's the winner. We're talking about him. That's God, right. Damn you, Skip Bayless. You're good. <laughs> You're so good. Okay, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Oh, the losers, all the Spieth haters out there, and I am one of them. I know. After 1,351 days of losing, he finally got a win. Valero, Texas Open, shot an 18-under. Admittedly looked pretty good out there, but let's be honest, the best players in the world weren't even in the field, Uh, but congratulations to speed for getting, I don't know, the first win of what, three and a half, four years. It's been a long time. He needed it. But I will say this. He will not make the cut at the Masters. Ooh, Just a little saying. prediction, huh? Mm-hmm. We'll have to uh, we'll have to wet the beak a little bit next episode <laughs> heading to the Masters. Let's go. Maybe we should. Should we try to get a golf person on? Do we know golf? Uh, Do you absolutely. know? Absolutely. Let's try to get a golf person. If anyone okay. out there has a suggestion of a golf person we should go after, let us know. Let us know. Hit us up on Twitter or in the uh, in the comments on Apple Podcasts. Five star review, and then tell us who. Do Do you know a golf person? Do you have like a golf person in mind? Like a a, a golfer or a golf? I analyst? don't know. Do we know any golfers on the PGA Tour? Like, there's a couple of you guys. I I know one, but I don't. <laughs> uh, how do you think someone would react by saying, "Hey, will you come on our podcast?" I know you tee off tomorrow morning in the Masters, but you know that's true. That would uh, <laughs> that would probably be like a that would not be a no. That would be a hell no. <laughs> it's like doing doing a podcast the late night before the uh, the Super Bowl. But what happens if? They did it, and then they it went is. out and played really well, and they're like, hey, we got to do it again, man. I'm superstitious. We could find also... a golf guy, though. That would be good. Golf analyst. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know who, but we'll find one. Did you see Spee's odds now for the Masters? Mm-mm. It's got the third shortest odds now to win. But see, it's so stupid. The guy just won for the first time in 1,351 days. And was almost out of the top 100 in the world. And he wins the Valero Texas Open without the best players in the world. And here he is. He's the Masters favorite. Guy's unbelievable. Dustin Johnson, 9 to 1. Justin Thomas, 10 to 1. Jordan Spieth, 11 to 1. What a joke. That's unbelievable. There's going to be a lot of people lose a lot of money betting on him. (laughs) (laughs) Or watch him him go out. He's hot. He's back, baby. If he wins the Masters, you're gonna be so mad. I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. That could be a that could be a tear the TV off the wall type of day. <laughs> Don't waste a perfectly good TV. Damn you, Speed! You've turned your career and life around. This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Riverwind. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. There are temperature screenings at all entrances and masks are required for all patrons and employees because your safety is Riverwind's number one priority. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. 
Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And Fridays in April from 6 p.m. to midnight, you can win your share of $100,000 in cash and bonus play in Riverwind's baskets and cash promotion. Let's go. If you need help finding your way, just favor, visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the one. And contact our friends at Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs. They'll help you execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. They're licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs can help with that too. They also offer Botox and fillers. To get on the path to losing weight, call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you will get a free fat burner injection. And don't forget to send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. They know that children need to be in school and are doing everything possible to make that happen. Bishop McGinnis students were welcomed back last August and saw very few interruptions in 2020. With a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. Okay, Ted, my winner of the weekend thought about going with whoever, whomever, whoever, whomever. I don't really know if I know how to use that. Whoever, I'm going to go with whoever, owned the Tom Brady rookie card that sold for $2.25 million this weekend. Why didn't I get more into cards? What the hell? They're, the card renaissance is, I mean, these prices are unbelievable. I also thought about going with Texas Tech Athletic Director Kirby Hocutt because he worked in some great jabs Loved at that. Texas in his press conference addressing Chris Beard leaving for Austin. I thought he he, he roasted Texas accordingly, and I, I thought it was pretty damn good by Kirby. And I like Kirby. He's a great guy. So I, uh, I will say this about Kirby. He did a great job of relaying – to his fan base that he did everything he could and he roasted Texas in the process and basically said, Hey guys, beard wanted to leave. He left. We offered him everything. We did everything we could. He left. Didn't care. Didn't give us a chance to match the offer. Now he gets to go coach in that stadium that has no fans in it. <laughs> I mean, he was just, it was great, but good, good for you, Kirby. Okay. I loved it, but I thought he handled it well. But my winner of the weekend is the University of Kansas. Teddy, bear with me here. Mm -hmm. Because they gave Bill Self, your favorite man, a lifetime contract. Now, Bill Self has been fantastic there. And he has earned that type of contract with the amount of success he has had on the court. This should help him in any in recruiting because, you know, some people are like, eh, is he going to go somewhere else? Going to go to the NBA? But I, uh, they are, they are my winner of the week. And because I just respect it so much. I, I respect when you look at the contract, there's something in there. There's a clause in there that says that no matter what happens with the NCAA investigation, they can't fire Bill Self for cause for the results of that invest investigation. Hell, Ted, if he gets suspended by the NCAA or suspended by the Big 12, they are still going to pay him some of his salary. I love this. I know some people look at it and go, "What do they not care about cheating? Do they not care about the integrity? What, what message does this send to young people? I love it because... At least Kansas is being honest about things. They don't care about following the rules. They don't care if Bill Self cheated. They are saying publicly, we do not care about that stuff. All Kansas cares about is winning basketball games because winning basketball games brings in a ton of money for Kansas. And in a very weird way, because Kansas was getting hammered 
for this contract and some of the things in it. It's kind of refreshing to me to see them indirectly saying to the public, we don't care about the cheating. We just want wins, baby. I, I thought it was, I, for some reason I saw it. I was like, you know what? That's kind of nice. It's ridiculous. Here's the thing. And, and I agree with everything that you're saying. It's just be upfront about, uh, you know, and I guess pretty much they already have been uh, even beforehand, but here's what is, I take away from this that the NCAA is worthless because essentially what has happened in this contract negotiation, Bill Self has said that he cheated, right? So the NCAA is still going to screw around forever. They're going to file, find all kinds of evidence and he's just going to skate. He's never going to get, he's never going to get punished. It's all right there out in the open. We've known about it for what a year and a half now, longer, maybe even longer and still nothing has happened. So we got to give it up to them. I like how they just like say, no, that's okay. We're just going to keep doing what we do. Don't worry about the NCAA. It's, it's great. It just shows how really worthless the whole organization is. We've got you for life, Bill. <laughs> You're a Jayhawk forever. Okay. My loser of the weekend thought about going with the Vancouver Canucks. Cause, Oh, I mean, yikes more than half the players and several coaches and their family members have tested positive for COVID. Sounds like a really bad situation for that team. I mean, ho hope everyone's okay, but also thought about going with people that don't like politics in their sports because Major League Baseball pulled the All-Star game and the Major League draft from Atlanta over a Georgia voting law. And people... There, there's a lot of opinions about it, but if people don't like sports and their or politics in their sports, those people are going insane. I assume the major league baseball, they don't even have to enter the fray. Like everyone else has been sucked in. Like the NFL was sucked in over the Anthem deal. No, they're just going to dive right in head first and cost the people of Atlanta a hundred million dollars. <laughs> just like, Hey, here we go. But my loser of the weekend, has to be people that listened to John Rom when he told them not to bet on him to win the Masters because he said he might have to leave because his wife may have a baby during the week of the Masters. Well, John Rom's wife had their son on Saturday. So Rom is good to go for Augusta. Now, certainly not going to get good odds on him now. And you probably weren't going to get good odds on him weeks ago. But I have a feeling some people are like, dude, I was going to throw them in a parlay. It was going to be great. I was going to do this with them. And now they're, I just have a feeling it made several gamblers mad, which is hilarious to me. But when you look at Rom, I mean, this is a guy he's played in the masters four times, he's got three top tens. But when I saw it, Ted immediately, I had an odd thought as well. And it's why. I made it my winner of the weekend. John Rom's son is going to be two months older than my son. Hmm. I cannot wait for my son and John Rom's son to go at it in golf tournaments until they both make it onto the PGA tour tour buddies, tour buddies. And maybe me and John Rom could be buddies. I would like that. That'd yeah. be nice. Now, Rom's kid. You already hit into him once out there in Hawaii. I didn't. I didn't hit into him. I just. <laughs> I drove the ball on the wrong fairway. That's it's a, that's a common mistake. One in eighteen run parallel, man. Lay off me. Dangerous. It's, that's dangerous. Just a, called it a power fade. Power fade. <laughs> but I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? I've really got to step my game up. And this, I, I'm just a psycho because I was like, Rom's kid is probably going to have some better instruction from his dad than I can give my son. So I got to figure out a way to narrow the gap, man. I'm already thinking of these crazy. I'm turning into a crazy sports parent before the kid's even born, man. This is not good. Yeah. You're going to have, you're going to have to get him an instructor. As soon as he can stand, he needs to have a club in his hand. Deal. I can do that. Yeah. Coming for you, John Rom's son. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what he named him. I'm sure it's something fancy too. So he's going to have a fancy name and a fancy golf, super good golf dad. We're and coming for gonna, you, Rom. He's probably going to win the Masters, too. 
Yeah, probably. He's gonna be. He's gonna have that new father glow. Oh yeah, that's that's the thing, right? It's like finally I can get a little bit of time away. He's gonna sleep like a baby. You know, it doesn't matter. Biggest uh, day of his life. Next day uh, has a, has a lead going into Sunday. It's like sleep like a baby because it ain't ever happening again. Yeah, we're coming for you, Roms. And just like that, episode 100. Triple digits, baby. Hey, cheers to you, bud. 100 episodes. Let's go. These cookies are good. Yeah, those are fantastic. See, this is the audio gold that our wives wanted right there. We did it. Mm -hmm. That'll make them happy. Okay, we'll we'll have a new podcast. It'll drop Thursday morning. We'll look for a golf person. We'll try to get a golf person to talk masters. And just a reminder... You can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Talk 1400, and you can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. It, okay, so I ate a little bite of the cookie because I was like, I don't need to eat it. It's late at night. But now I just had a bite. I'm going to eat the whole thing. That's not good. I'm gonna, are you kidding me? I've been, it's been sitting there the whole time. You're lucky I didn't eat it a long time ago, <laughs> halfway through the show. Okay. Until next time. We appreciate you all for listening. and Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.